Welcome everybody to New Polities Podcast. We are deeply honored to have Mr. Ted Benna join us today. Mr. Benna is the father of the 401k. He is the guy that figured out how to utilize this tax code to save for retirement, which so has really and quite genuinely changed the financial industry that has genuinely changed the social order uh, in the last uh, 40 years since it's uh, in discovery, I guess I'll put it like that. So, Mr. Bennett, thank you so very much for joining us. Well, you're welcome, Jacob. And Ted's fine, by the way. You don't need to be that. Okay. Right. <laughs> you're very kind. Um, Mark exclusively goes by Sovereign Barnes, so yeah. just to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> Ted, thanks so much for coming on. We really, uh, we really appreciate it. I've, I, in these conversations that we have, um, I'm sort of the, I'm sort of the dumb one. So forgive me if I am not as uh, able with the various technical lingo as as Jacob here. I will try to keep up, but I'll probably ask some questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, can we, <laughs> he is well, let me let me ask this so when you were uh this is back in 1980 when you were set a particular task of for for a company as a consultant to discover um how to utilize um uh, or rather how to how to reduce the number of taxes the amount of taxes that the corporation had to pay in salaries could you tell us that first story um, and what exactly you were tasked with with doing and um, and how you discovered the use of the 401k yeah well it was a uh, it was a Philadelphia area bank and you know actually the uh, what they were looking to accomplish they had a pension plan and they also had a cash bonus plan mm -hmm. and they were expanding and they were needing to hire senior level management people, you know, in order to be able to grow. And they were competing with larger banks where typically those banks, in addition to a pension plan, had what was called a um, cash or deferred profit sharing plan. And the way those plans worked was that Banks over the years had been getting rid of cash bonus plans for various reasons, but IRS allowed without any legislation to back it up the existence of cash or deferred plans. And the way they worked is the bank, if they eliminated the bonus, let's say you know they paid two weeks bonus out, uh, they would designated now for this cash deferred plan. And, you know, what happened is half of it had to be deferred. You didn't have a choice. You were mm -hmm. invested for retirement. The other half, you could take its cash or you could defer it either way. So what happened is in 1972, you know, IRS said, uh, you know, we aren't really comfortable with these plans because the higher paid employees are tending to defer it all, the lower paid are taking the cash part, and you know, the higher paid are getting too big of a tax break, we think. So anyhow, that put them on hold. And that hold didn't get cleared up until 1978. So 78 legislation was passed by Congress, added page and a half to the Internal Revenue Code. They added paragraph K under section 401. And, you know, that established how these plans would work in the future. So anyhow, you know, I, I was aware of this legislation. I mean, it was enacted in 78, didn't become effective until 1980, January of 80. And, you know, it was <coughs> expected to have, have limited usage. So what happened when I, when I was designing this <coughs> solution for the bank client, and they wanted to eliminate the cash bonus. They said, well, now the way this can work is employees will have the option to defer as little or as much as they want. You know, we could go from zero to 100%. Each employee would be given that choice. And I realized that lower paid employees putting money 
away and deferring it longer term. The tax break wasn't going to be big enough of an incentive to get them to do that. Mm. So I then came up with the idea of adding to it a matching employer contribution. And there wasn't anything in this section that said you could do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, there were in existence what were known as thrift or savings plans. Big companies had them. We had them in our little company where employees put money in after tax and they got some match from the employer. So, mm. so they, they already existed. So I said, well, let's take that, you know, and add it now into this to give employees additional savings. So I could go out and say, if you do this, you'll get a tax break, plus you'll get more money from the bank. Well, the bank turned us down because their attorney didn't want them pioneering something. So we actually did the first plan in our own little company. You know, oh, no kidding. Companies, and that became effective January 1 of 1980. So that was actually the first 401k savings plan. Now, the other part of it was I also realized that employees could pretend, potentially reduce their salaries and make pre-tax employee contributions in. So mm -hmm. not only get a match, but employees be able to put you know, money in themselves pre-tax. And again, there wasn't anything that you know, said you could do any of those, but knowing my Bible pretty well, there wasn't anything else so that said thou shalt not. So <laughs> I chose to take the more aggressive uh, interpretation and eventually that got supported by uh, Treasury, you know, when they issued proposed regulations. Ted, I'm, in, in listening to that, um, that description, I might be missing it. Where is the point at which um, those contributions <coughs> by either employers or employees are invested in the stock market? Or is that simply what's being presumed? That, that, that's actually a side issue, Mark. Mm -hmm. you know, first, oh, okay. first of all, 401k was a qualified retirement plan. I see. And what this did was it, you know, it helped benefit employees by converting many spenders into savers. You know, by making saving the first priority for them and then getting an employer match. Separate issue altogether was where the money got invested. Well, before you know, we get you know, in. The, 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 what I had first was just basic operational structure, you know, that was right. legal. And then the whole investment's a whole different animal altogether. What happened and, and we'll get and in. how that emerged. Gotcha. I'm very interested in, in, in what you think of, of that emergence later on. But w let me, let's, before we get on to that, I'm very interested because one of the first articles that came out about the 401k uh, phrased it as a salary reduction plan. When that came out in the Wall Street Journal way back when, did you think of that as a, like an enemy attack or this is false marketing or they're trying to take down my idea? W what was your reaction? Well, no, in reality, that's what it is. Right. You know, what happens is employees actually sign an agreement for employers to reduce their salary, mm -hmm. and that then technically becomes an employer contribution into the plan on their behalf. No, I mean, it was clearly that's what it was. I mean, I wasn't offended at all, and you certainly didn't deny, well, yeah, that's what's happening, you know. That's, that's so when employees on. join, that they actually sign an agreement <laughs> they authorize employers to reduce their salary. Right. So let me ask again, a, a, a tangential question to that, but very interesting. You, you've been uh, uh, on the record before in saying that during this time, you found that there was a great tension that you felt between your Christian faith and the state of the um, market at the time and what you were being asked to, to do. Could you tell us about that tension and and how how you found ways of, of resolving that, if you did? Well, I, actually, the first tension was at the time that this happened, I was considering getting out of the business I was in because primarily what I was doing was helping professionals like doctors and attorneys set up plans where they got a gigantic tax break, and particularly the doctors, many of them wanted to give as little as possible to their employees. 
you know, and I was good at designing those plans, you know, legally. Mm -hmm. And so I had reached a point, you know, where we had four children and the youngest was emerging off into adulthood and, you know, was beginning to refocus and consider, well, where does, where does God want me spending the rest of my life? And it was actually mm -hmm. at that stage that I got involved on the board of a Christian college and then a seminary board. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but as I was processing, then the other thing I did was got pretty deeply involved in Chris, Church, Christian Business Men's Committee. And, you know, as I was prayerfully going through that process, I got this idea, you know, this thing happened. And my wife asked me at the time, you know, uh, you know why did that happen? that happen? I said, well, <laughs> I don't have a reason, you know. But over the years then, and, you know, Money Magazine and Forbes and, you know, other USA Today and so forth, mm -hmm. I was able to explain, you know, that connection. And look, hey, I wasn't smart enough to come up with this on my own. You know, it was divinely happened. So that deals with that spiritual piece of it. You know, on the other, on the investment part of it, uh, what happened, and it you know, gets into the history of on the investment side, how that mm -hmm. developed, and, and that's the part that I got very troubled about, and, you know, and still am, you, you know, that what's happened on that piece of it. And now I, you know, really... You know, the biggest thing that's been work trying to resolve that are, the, are suits by participants saying, hey, you know, we've gotten grossly overcharged, you know. Right, right. Well, I'm, I'm very I interested in, in two th things, particularly um, in some of the repercussions of, of the 401k. But it is, just to make sure this is clear and to re reiterate what you already said, is that the program that you created was primarily a savings vehicle, but it didn't define the means by which you were savings. And so later on, people utilized this to move into the stock market. So that in 1982, 20% of Americans were in the secondary market. 20 years later, the majority are in. And you, you've said before that you've seen this this swelling of the financial industry as, as something extremely worrying. Could you could you tell us a little bit about the growth that you witnessed over over the last 40 years of of the financial sector and and why that's worried you? Well, well cl clearly the mutual fund industry mm -hmm. uh, it wouldn't be anywhere near what it was without 401k. Right. I mean you had mm -hmm. Fidelity, you had Vanguard, uh, but yeah, they were pretty much mom pop operations, you know, at the time. Wow. I mean, very, very small, okay. And, you know, the first 401k plans had only two options they had a fixed and then an equity. You know, and the, equ the equity at that point was some mutual fund. You know, the fix was usually guaranteed by an insurance company. And you split your investments in 25% multiples. <laughs> so it's either 0, 100, 50, 50, 75, 25. You know, it took me about a minute to explain to participants. So, You're right. You know. <laughs> then what happened is a third option got at, added. It was a balance fund, which was kind of strange because you could get balanced by taking the first two and splitting half and half or whatever. So then what happened is employers began to listen to what were either more knowledgeable or more troublesome employees who kept right, saying, right. why don't you have this fund or why don't you have that fund or whatever? And then, so they began to add them. But, you know, what happened, you know, the first ugly transition here was when employers originally, originally employers paid all the administrative costs. And the only thing employees paid were actual total net investment costs, which typically were only about one tenth of one percent, you know, roughly about what are wow. called 10 or 15 basis points. Right. Well, the first change that happened was Fidelity went out to big employees and said, hey, you can transfer your 401k. We'll handle it totally and bundle it all together. And you don't pay any administrative cost. Yeah. So, oh so the bundling that happened were the fees. And the fees got all dumped on participants. And, you know, I mentioned in one of the, the book that I sent you that 
-hmm. I interviewed the uh, HR manager for AT&T and, and when I was writing one of my books, and he said he was getting pressured one year to eliminate money you know, from his HR budget, and he was able to shift 100000 of administrative fees off to participants by moving the plan to fidelity. So that was the first thing. Then the next one that happened is we had the... Can I, can I just inter interrupt to ask one clarifying question? So at that point, it was one-tenth of... It was 10 basis points, one-tenth of 1% one were, the, were the fees. Today, where well, are Well, that's they? where I'm heading. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> so, so with that first step, they generally went up to you know, around 100 basis points. Amazing. You, you know, maybe even a bit beyond that. Maybe even the 150. Yep. So the next thing that happened was the emergence of investment advice and financial advisors. So what happened was originally the financial players resisted provide, making advice available participants because they were afraid it was going to have an adverse impact on the revenue. Well, then they realized we can make even more money out of, out of this, and, and so can the advisors by layering on top an additional level of fees, which is what they did. So they added what are called wrap fees or managed accounts, whatever, and, and that's for 401ks, also applies to IRAs, and that pushed fees up into the 150 to 275 basis point range. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and... What's so nasty about that is you're talking about years less of retirement income just as a result of those fees. And, and those fees are, are being charged monthly, annually? On, well, on they basically runs? daily. I mean, they're, you, you know, wow. I mean, whenever they're deducted, I mean, they're just every, every day, you know, they're a, a charge and, against the account. So if somebody has is saving for thirty years, do you do you have? I wonder, do you have numbers to say like the difference of what uh, you know a hundred basis points versus two hundred are? Well, you're talking twenty percent or so, just you know, yeah, one you know, that difference. But That's difference incredible. between yeah. you know fifteen and two hundred seventy five, you're talking you know forty percent or so differential. Wow. Yeah. So That's Ted, incredible. if I'm if I'm understanding this correctly. Um, <clears throat> the it's not the the what these fees pay for isn't necessary to an employee putting money into a 401k and then the uh you know receiving maybe a match from his employer uh but this is only necessary insofar as this money is then invested through a mutual fund um, that that these these fees are essentially paying for the mutual fund and for financial advice. Um, that is to say, advice on what to invest in. Yeah, and that's and that's happening actually for most ways that individuals are investing. You know, most of them are investing, working with advisors. You know, from the big name brand advisory firms and. You know, even if it's an IRA, if it's an IRA with one of these prepackaged managed account arrangements, they're still paying those kind of fees. It's not just an, a problem with 401k. Now, let me also mention that, you know, for larger companies, you know, the big companies now, fees are much less than that. Um, you, you know, they're in uh, a, a lot more reasonable range and are not a significant problem. And of course, some of that has happened because of participants suing. You know, even at Fidelity, their, mm -hmm. their employees sued <laughs> because they're being charged <laughs> too much. And uh, so, you know, the bigger, bigger firms, why that's less of a problem, but it still pretty widely exists at smaller employers. Do, yeah. Do you, and do you think em employees are told about this, that this is where their money is going? Uh, Department of Labor has issued regulations for fees to be disclosed, but, uh, okay. you know, so they have to be revealed. Uh, that, you know, many, many of the higher cost providers really resisted that effort. And uh, so now they, they need to be disclosed, but how they get disclosed are 
not that easy to understand and you know matter of whether participants really pay a whole lot of pretend uh, attention to sure. it's still an issue for sure yeah yeah of course now now also by the way uh you know there's an alternative that makes it very easy for any investor to invest at very low cost uh you know in most 401ks and, and as individuals as well and those are what are called as target date funds which you know, I'm sure you know you fellows have heard of. Mm-hmm. You know, they're the ones that are, have numbers like 220, 230, 240, whatever. And what they do is they're they're pre-mix pre-mix packages that mix different types of investments together that are considered appropriate for your for your age. You know, when you're expected to withdraw money. And so, what happens with those if they're invested in what are known as index funds? You know, which don't have high management fees to, you know, they only cost, uh, you know, 10, 15 basis points or so. You know, Schwab or Vanguard, you know, Fidelity, you know, have very co- low cost, you know, target date index funds that are av- widely available. Gotcha. Well, one, one other question that I have, and this is, you know, a, something that, or like ramifications that came from the 401k that you've also commented on. And I'm really curious that I've been wanting to ask you this question for a long time. And it's particularly about retirement um, where you've, you were asked once by an interviewer from Forbes, you know, what, what on earth did people do prior to the 401k for retirement? And you replied, it really wasn't a big deal. I, I would love for you to comment on that. Is that is that true? Were they capturing your words correctly in that interview? Yeah, most retirees, when we go back to my parents' generation, um, mm-hmm. you, you know, they didn't sit around at family gatherings talking about how they were investing in retirement money. I mean, that was right. an on <laughs> issue. Uh, you know, they received Social Security. They may have received a pension plan, you know, which my dad, dad did, uh, you know, for his late, later years, he worked uh, for the State Park Commission. And, uh, mm. you know, my uncles, uh, one was a teacher and, you know, and another one uh, worked uh, mil- military service support. And, you know, they had pensions and, and then they had some personal savings. Uh, but, you know, the personal savings, I mean, my dad just stuck it in a, you know, savings account. I mean, always personal savings. Uh, Certainly, stock market was off the radar. Now, I had another uncle. <laughs> now I think about it, he sold one of the family farms to my oldest brother, went off to Florida, probably in his <laughs> mid-40s or so. He spent all his time in, you know, in watching the ticker tape and uh, how he was <laughs> investing. And that, that was, you know, how he managed his uh, time and his money after he sold off the farm. <laughs> but he was an anomaly for yeah, the, for the was, time. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. was a diff- different character. Right. So w- so within that change, within that alteration, I read an, an article by uh, Professor Gerald Davis at the University of Michigan. I'm not sure if you've ever come across him, um, but he said, he, this is statistics, very easy to remember because there's a lot of numbers that are repeated. But in 1977, 77% of American households had savings account. And then 12 years later in 1988, that that number actually drops by 33%. And so that's, that's part of the phenomenon that you're, you're addressing and and that you're, you're talking about. But within that, and of course, this is not predetermined about by the by the 401k as a savings instrument, but really in terms of what happened later with with mutual funds and and with the investment route, the equity route, the option that you, that you talked about, um, leading to families not uh, retiring together, or, or rather, mom and dad moving in with 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 son and or daughter. Um, can I ask you about that? What what have you thought about that structural change of the family? Well, that's unfortunate uh, because you know our creator. Uh, created man and woman, you know, mm-hmm. and families. And uh, that was to be an integrated unit. Uh, today, you know, many children are in single family homes. I mean, never been married. I mean, 
right. you know, well, I think 50% or something like that anymore are, you know, in non-traditional environments and settings. And then even ones where there have been mom and dad and they've been together, you know, the destruction of marriage and so many divorces and you now and then in later years getting blended families, etc. You know, even in those situations, the likelihood of embracing, you know, elderly members of the family is uh, it's just not likely to happen. You know, it's been a very uh, horrible, um, you know, moral breakdown. Right. We we see here, and one of the things that we talk about so much at, at New Polity is are the the virtues and vices, the the characters of of the soul that either make us look more like Jesus or, or less like Jesus, and and so part of the, the the strategies and the mechanisms and the policies that we create as a society really are only emerging out of um, the virtues that we form or the vices that we form, um, and so we, we see that the only real rectitude to the financial situation is a is a return to to Christ, um, but but I'm curious also about some of these turns. Obviously, there's effects and habits that are created uh, through the policies of a of a country, and and one thing that I, I read uh, not long ago was that there is a, a general American disdain for the stock market that that really went throughout its history. The first president ever to say something positive about Wall Street was Calvin Coolidge. And that makes sense for the time, right? And then immediately afterwards, something really bad happened, the Great Depression, and so nobody said anything good until Ronald Reagan. And then Ronald Reagan was really the first to, to you know, not only see um, Wall Street, not in a dark light, but in a bright light. and no president since him has uh, failed to comment on Wall Street as, as a positive entity in, in the U.S. Um, but what I'm kind of gather, I'm wondering if if that was part of the stigma that you were raised with, and what your exposure to the secondary market that you that was around the family table um, during Christmas. Uh, my my dad was pretty well. He was definitely anti stock market. I mean, that didn't even exist and. He was also anti-insurance. Ah, interesting. Life yeah. insurance. I remember <laughs> my memory of that was one time he was out in the tractor, you know, mowing, I think, and the insurance guy stopped along the road where he was, and he just kept going and ignored him. <laughs> <laughs> and That's not great. To say that was a good thing because I have a lot of permanent life insurance <laughs> myself. Certainly not for my benefit, for my, you know, sure, family. Sure. No, you're still on a farm, is that right? Yeah, I'm still on a little small farm, a couple of horses that my wife has. Yeah. Oh, great! My my wife grew up on a on a, a, a friend's horse farm as well, yeah. so we we have that in. Yeah, common. well, I grew up on a dairy farm, and I started earning income at okay. so my income at age six, and at eighty two, I'm still keeping it going. But last year was wow. pretty pretty limited, so I'm trying to gear it back up a bit. It's not Ooh, that's a good great. idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fun. It seems like the um, norm now for my parents' generation and my generation sort of looking at my parents is that everything they need will ideally be taken care of by money. So everything my parents need uh, will be taken care of by money. Their health will be taken care of by money. Um, and really, it's any sense of the family being uh, necessary to retirement is gone. Um, so it's almost seen as a failure, um, both for the child and for the adult in this situation, if there's any expectation that the child will care for his elderly um, parents. And it's not just seen as a failure because, um, you know, the the uh, the adult is proud or something like that, but also because the, it seems like the way that, um, the, the way we expect a return on our, uh, retirement savings has meant that there's really no reason besides maybe irresponsibility or not making the choice to contribute to the 401k early on, 
that there's really no reason not to be pretty much set and taken care of um, through money in in your old age. And the troubling part is that, or what's troubling to me is I would hope that despite that, people would still see that it's a positive good to take care of the people that took care of you, that it is something we're called to do really without reference to uh, what money we happen to have on hand. But I don't think that's what's actually happened. I think what's actually happened is a new, um, <coughs> a new normal has come into being, and that normal is that um, adults live out the end of their lives on the returns they make um, from the stock market in uh, isolation from their children, and their children um, really have nothing to do with that per se. Now, do you think that um, this is a a necessary result of the way that we are now saving for retirement, or do you think it's something we could have avoided? I, I don't think it's really a result of how we're saving for retirement. I think it's just more what I mentioned before of the breakdown of family connectivity. I mean, right. you think but, that's that's the bigger issue, which obviously certainly ties into the spiritual realm more than the financial. Yeah. And because of that breakdown, I think you know, what's happened is people have to be concerned that, gee, I I better take better care of myself financially, you know, because I don't, can't count on anybody else, you know, to do that. Mm. Mm. So you actually think that the, the habit or the uh, activity of taking care of our parents through uh, money through investment in the stock market is not the cause of our like fragmentation, but is in fact us trying to save ourselves from fragmentation that's coming from another source. Well, I think the fragmentation's happening and it's not getting better. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just broken down. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you know, our family, I mean, we, you know, I have four children. We have strong relationships, you know, with them, but, uh, you, you know, and I know they won't let us out in the street. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, yeah, it is. But, yeah, it, we've it, been fortunate that, you know, my wife and I have been together for uh, 64 years, so, wow. y you know, it, uh, this has mm. been my third marriage or whatever, why it'd be a whole different ball game. You're so, right. Yeah, that's right. Well, what it, it, I'm sorry, and what happens with that, I mean, uh, yeah, you you guys know from what you're involved in. I mean, when there's divorce, us usually one member of the family is, you know, just totally out of the picture. I uh, was right, in recently so. to get my uh, hearing aid. I, I lost one. I had to go in to get one. And you guy that does that now had been a former pastor that you know, the church I went to. And what happened is, you know, they had four kids. His marriage blew up. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, he had to leave the ministry and, uh, mm. you know, he had, and he was telling me, I asked him, so how, how, how about your kids? You know, and you're bringing, how are you doing? You know, he, hasn't, he hasn't had any contact with his four kids for 17 years or something like that. His wife has just totally been negative and about him and sent a lot of nasty things to the kids about him. And, you know, it's, it's totally broken relationship. So, yeah, you know, that's that's an example. You know where obviously mm -hmm. the kids aren't thinking. Well, hey, maybe we'll be taking care of dad someday. You know, <laughs> right, right, right. And and then so money begins to take the place of the of the family. And so because people were already moving in that vector, you you see that as this is an alternative that they can choose right uh, over the family. But 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 well, again but again probably you know half of the population we're talking about just financially aren't in, in a position where they're even able to accumulate savings. And, mm. you know, that's a huge concern of mine. And, um, you know, one of the things I'm working on, you know, now, but, you know, the a recent study I just read about, uh, 36% of the population have more credit card debt than savings. You know, right. so they're in yeah. a negative position. Yeah. 
No, it is incredible that that the it's. I'm not sure if it's the the majority or close to it of, of Americans have a negative net worth. You know, you just talk about credit card debt, but you add up everything else that we have. And one one of you know our great heroes is, is Pope Leo the Thirteenth, who commended the the husband and the father, the family of of saving so that he could procure productive property that he might be economically dependent. You know, I mean, this is goes back to. Um, your family, your father, and how, how you're raised is uh, being on a farm, being being financially um, independent of means. That doesn't necessarily mean uh, super liquid in cash, but it means that able to provide well for your family and those that you love. Um, and that that's certainly uh, a very worrying fact. What, you know, there's certain number of things that come to my mind, you know, the, the changing... Um, principles of, of currency and currency manipulation that comes to mind. The stock market certainly comes to mind of, of ways in which it's become harder and harder to um, obtain the things necessary uh, to be a, a provider for a family. What would, would you add anything to that list? No, it's a, I definitely concern. It brought to mind the fact that uh, I really give my father a lot of credit because one of the things mm. he did was rather than just being laborers, he actually gave us money. Oh, interesting. Okay. And, you know, each one of us had a cow, and we got money for the milk that was produced. And then my uh, mother had all the berries, you know, raspberries, strawberries, etc. We got paid to pick them, and that was my first sales experience. I've been in sales ever since. <laughs> it was going door to door when I was six, seven years old and selling berries. And uh, <laughs> but anyhow, I bought savings bonds, you know. Mm. So I learned to become a saver, uh, you know, at that point in time. Which, you know, we have spenders and savers. How old were you when you bought savings bonds? Oh, under ten. I mean, wow! <laughs> and you did that on your own without well, your father. Well, my dad. He, I mean, okay, yeah, definitely he. Okay, and. You know, the big issue we have around all of this is they're spenders and savers. Mm. Problem with spenders is regardless of how much they make, it's never enough. And I could give you examples of that. Oh, sure. You know, well, the problem is, rent. well, if I just get a little bit more, then I'll save. But it doesn't happen. If they get more, it still gets spent. <laughs> and, you know, if I wanted to get borrow $1,000 from... Some people, you know, there's some I could go to that would readily have it available to lend who you think would be most unlikely to. And there's some living in big, huge houses that you would think, well, it'd be very easy for them and, and they don't have it available. You know, they're mm -hmm. overextended on the edge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or maybe even just thinking that they are, you know, I mean, that happens all the time. Whereas without a taste of what's actually necessary, rather than just falling or falling into luxury upon luxury, we don't know what, what is actually necessary uh, for our livelihood. And therefore, we don't share or give, uh, you know, provide alms to people that, that need it because we've, we're so confused and lost in figuring out what's really needed and sure. what's just nice to have. I think, I think that's certainly a, a part of it. I think one of the principles that we, we like to think about here is that you know, money is just a placeholder. And so it's good to always know what it's holding a place for, you know, sure. and, and a savings account is like fattening a pig, you know, is that you do it for a particular purpose of one day eating it, right? And so I, w I wonder, I would love to hear your, your comments on that. You know, this a saver is someone who, uh, a good saver is one that knows how to spend really well and know, knows what they're saving for. It, I, you know, you, you, you have this, this wonderful uh, dichotomy that you have between savers and spend spenders. Would you would you agree with that oh, principle well, that, that the good saver is a good spender? Well, and I, everybody needs to have a budget. You know, whether you're yeah. actively working or whether you're, you're retired. I mean, you need to be tracking your expenses versus your know, budget and, and income. I mean, other than that, you're just kind of working blindly. Yeah. Yeah. I have a <clears throat> just brief question. I'm trying to understand it. Um, why would a employee agree to have their salary reduced? Uh, like at the very beginning of this, uh, 
of the 401k plan. The employee's agreeing to have a salary reduced. Uh, and then he's agreeing to it just because he has the goal of saving or was there already um, the sense that if he uh, took a reduction in salary, it would be um, a greater amount given by the company when it came t time for retirement? It's a com combination of just <laughs> per personally, and I'm pretty typical. We had four kids. We had a mortgage. Uh, you know, certainly at the end of the month, we didn't have money left. Mm -hmm. So two, two reasons why I put 6% into our plan. What well, one is it wasn't happening otherwise. And the other was our company matched ranging from 25 to 50 cents per dollar, depending on your years of service. Mm -hmm. So if I, I put 6% in, I got 3% from the company. It was 9%. Uh, you know, that wouldn't have been happening otherwise. Gotcha. You know, it just it didn't happen, and uh, so that that was the primary reason, and that's that's true for most. I mean, people, uh, you know, that have I guess any sense of economic uh, well being realize that we shouldn't be spending everything. You know, we should be setting something aside, you know, for the future because life's very uncertain, and the f idea of uh, you, you know, well, at age 50 or 60 or whatever, somebody else taking care of us, uh, you know, you sh certainly shouldn't be thinking that's going to be, uh, you know, likely what the outcome will be. And uh, so, you know, you, mo most people do it for that reason. They know, no, hey, we, we really ought to be saving. And, and then obviously with a 401k, if you get money from the employer, it's kind of hard to turn that down. Yeah, I mean, I... It just keeps coming back to this idea that the, you know, most of, for most of human history, we relied on each other in our retirement. Um, as you said, it's just, it wasn't a conversation at, you know, family dinners as far as what you were, uh, what you were doing in order to take care of yourself in your in your old age, um, and I'm wondering if you, it seems like what's happened with the financialization of the 401k, and also as you as you rightly mentioned, just the breakdown of the family um, from many other sources, uh, we not only can't expect family to take care of us, but it's not even. Um, something we bemoan the loss of. It's just, it's just not part of our, not part of our lives, um, and it's experienced as a as a sort of failure if it comes up. Do you think it's, um, do you think that there is a way in which we could return to the expectation that we take care of each other, that families take care of each other? Um, or do you think that that's simply a a lost um, a lost age, and that you know? Well, this side of heaven, is... I'm not sure that's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, another thing came to mind uh, is the fact that when we go back to the time that Social Security started, you know, and even in my parents' generations. Uh, Retirement was usually something like a 10-year event. Now it's more often become a 20, 30-year or more event. Mm. And that significantly impacted things as well. Because if you're talking about what you need, regard, regardless of the source of it, you know, uh, it takes five times as much when you factor in 3% inflation to provide for 30 years than it does for 10 mm. years. Mm. You know, it doesn't take three times as much. Right. So mm. the thing is, if that burden falls on my children, where are they going to be in their future then? You know, another thing that comes to mind here too that's significant we haven't talked about as well is, is health care. Yeah. You know, we have a huge burden in terms of 
health care expenses for elderly. And one of the things that's troubling to me about that is that people, you know, my age who expect that unlimited amounts are going to be spent for them, you know, in terms of meeting health care needs. And I don't expect to ever go that route. You know, I, I reach a point where you know, it's highly, highly questionable about what my future might be healthcare wise. And I dealt with this with cancer, you know, uh, 20 years ago. Um, you know, my, what I ask, you know, when a family member is complaining about, gee, I can't get approved for spending $250,000 for whatever procedure, I said, well, you realize your kids are going to pay for that. Now, mm. if, if you, you have the money available and can pay for that out of pocket yourself, would you do that? You know, would you make that decision, you know, to have that level of medical treatment provided? And, you know, it's a question we should be asking ourselves. Yeah, it does seem like it, it when you put it like that, it's quite right. Like if we have an indefinite need to spend on our health, if we're unwilling to die, if we're scared to die, and we don't have a sense of a... Um, of an acceptance of the mortality <laughs> of human existence, then it's sort of a, um, there's no end to that number, right? There's no end to how much money we might put in trying to, trying to stave off, uh, death. It seems like, it, it seems like in some ways it's, it's, it's this odd back and forth where we have, um, a kind of indefinite, healthcare cost at the end of life. And then we're also, and in some ways that's, that's motivating, um, like a, uh, seeking larger returns in terms of, of retirement and that these things feed each other. Like there's, you know, there's no, I don't see an end point at which we say enough is enough if we don't, um, really, face the fact of, of human mortality at some point. That, that's a factor. And then, of course, you know, when we talk about the ultra-wealthy, you know, I know some of the business people I dealt with who yeah, certainly were, you know, had significant wealth. Uh, it, was, it was never enough, you know. They were still, you know, the push, mm. push to have more. And, uh, yeah, that's limited uh, number that fall in that category, but... Uh, you know, it's unfortunate to see that happening. Mm -hmm. well, as we we're kind of coming to a close, I wanted to ask you, you know, with you, you love sacred scripture and, and, and love reading it. Obviously, Jesus talks about money quite a, quite a bit. Are there certain, is there a particular passage that has kind of led you in, in your own um, life? I mean, having spent so much time working in, in this financial sector and, and building in the way that you have... What has been kind of a, a lodestar from, from Christ himself yeah. in the Gospels? Oh, there, there, there are a lot of them. I mean, you know, financially, the one about, uh, you know, <laughs> just went blind. Like, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided unto you. Uh, certainly mm. that comes to mind that, you know, where your first focus needs to be. And, you know, the fact that regardless of what it is, uh, Realizing the fact that we don't own any of it, you, mm -hmm. you know, when he, the rich man uh, wanted to accumulate more and mill bigger more barns and whatever, and he said, hey, this life, today your life will be taken from you, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, the, that reality that, you know, none of it's ours and we're not going to take any of it with us. Mm -hmm. Well, Ted, thank you so much for this a chance, this opportunity to, to speak with you and in, in the in the interview, and uh, we we appreciate it so much. And we'll, um, you know, there's there's it's I think for so many people it's shocking uh, to hear some of the ways in which society has changed. And hearing you as as a founder of uh, so much of this change, uh, you know, it's it's just shocking to hear you know about the breakdown of the family uh, from your own mouth and hearing things like retirement wasn't 
you know, something that we thought of, you know, from your own mouth. And, and so it's, I think it's really important to, to hear this and to, to consider it um, afresh and anew. And so thank you so much for doing that with us. Yeah, today. and then, well, the anything I'd throw in too is again, I have Please. peace about where we are. I mean, no matter how, how troubling that it is, because I know God's in control, you know, and Amen. Yes. You know, it's Absolutely. his destiny that's being played out. And so I have total peace with that fact. So oh, thank you, guys. Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. Ted, All right. Ted, thank you. It sounds like your uh, your kids will take care of you no matter how, how the uh, stock market goes. And so I'm, I'm <laughs> glad to hear it. But if, if everything falls through, you can give us a call and we'll see what we can do. I have a question. <laughs> I was tempted to ask it. Uh, yes. uh, we're going to say, well, so what are you guys doing? <laughs> what are we up to? Well, we're financially. Without a 401k? Oh, what do we do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Ted, I, I hate to, I know we're coming to a, to a close here. I mean, for the, the trouble I've had with the 401k, I realize now actually it's been very enlightening after this conversation. It's really not so much with the 401k and savings. I mean, you could quibble about what to save for and how, how much to allow uh, fear take, you know, take a part of our saving for retirement, but the way at which it invests you into all of these um, companies that increasingly have just become, to my limited vision here, a, a real detriment to society. It just seems to tie employees to the stock market um, in a way that's unquestioned. It's just like. And, and so in rejecting it, it's, yeah, like it's not just a rejection of, of savings or responsibility. It's, it's a rejection of this way in which savings and responsibility has been tied to the support of the major power uh, structures of the world today, which I just sure. do not, I do not trust them. I don't sure. think anyone should. Uh, so what do we do? Well, um, <laughs> one, <laughs> the biggest thing we do is we try to uh, tell our children that, they will be taking care of us <laughs> and treating them in such a way that it seems less uh, uh, tyrannical and more yeah, of a joy to do that. Joy, yeah. You know? yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, investing in our families, um, investing in businesses and properties within our town. So trying to make, um, trying not to split off the use of our money um, from what, what we need. So well, how do I put it? Sorry. This is a really great place to, to do that precisely because the majority, the vast majority of storefronts in Steubenville are all boarded up. And so actually putting our money where our life is, is, is made way easier. It's a much easier decision for us here than maybe say, you know, a Seattle where I was raised sure. um, or, or a DC where I briefly lived, you know, because because here, once we want a grocery store in downtown, we didn't have it until Mark started it. You know, um, we don't. We, we there's yeah. There's no. There's no. Uh, you know, place to go out and eat. That was kind of a recent luxury of of Steubenville. There is. Uh, uh, there's there's really um, so many different opportunities that we have. Uh, downtown to start building and to start recreating a vision of of how to build um, that um, will not only we think um, be a, worth it, the very least the financial risk of it and probably pay off in the end um, but also is is worth the shot just for the common good alone and for the friendships uh, that develop through it is that we we know the people that we're investing in um, and that builds a great friendship and especially if that's the number one goal rather than the return itself uh man that that just makes life rich yep. in and of itself right yeah and I, I think that that um increasingly um i i do think that there jacob's right that student law offers some unique opportunities but i think generally that turn to local investment um, where if we are trying to retain the value of money, we don't think first and foremost, okay, let's forget how, let's just get the results. So let's just invest in a, in a Vanguard or let's just get some way of taking this money I have and putting it somewhere. I don't want to know what they're doing with it. I don't know. I don't care how sure. it works. I just want to return because if I can get that, then then I've got my retirement taken care of. I, I think that's the wrong attitude. And so However it plays out in any particular person's life, it seems what's exciting and motivating 
is to say, no, 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 if I'm if I want to receive any return, what good can I concretely do here in order to in to order to merit it? So maybe it's improving this or that building. Maybe it's getting a house uh, ready for a family that wants to to move into town or, or something like that. Maybe it's being um, you know a very good landlord or something like that. Um, but I think the 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 trend um, among us, but also of of many of the people we know is to, I guess, kill two birds with one stone. So do some good in the community, uh, but in such a way that you're also um, not just uh, losing money by having it, you know, under your mattress or something sure. like that. Uh, crazy. Mm-hmm. And w- we, we hope that our retirements are not 20 and 30 years you know, well, that's the other well. thing. Yeah, that's, yeah, Jacob's that's the other right. Side. We, and uh, so part of relieving the burden for our kids or kind of expecting of that is, is trying to contribute to it as, as much as possible. You, you know, insofar as we're we're still working, we're still adding to the common good, we're still adding to our city. Um, you know, and at one point we might need to move in with them sooner rather than later, um, but hopefully we can be a contributing aspect to, to that household my my dad is from the was from the middle east and so intergenerational living was kind of a a no-brainer it's just what you did over there and so um you know i have to poke a white person every once in a while and say hey this is pretty normal in human history so (laughs) yeah Yeah. and i think that um it's been a lot of fun in that way because it involves you know i think a lot of men a lot of young men actually really want to use money and to 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 do things with it i mean it's if it's a reward for our labor um you know being able to actually use that reward is is very exciting and so i think that's i don't know that's something that jacob's really opened my eyes to that it's um it's not just supposed to be something you don't think about, something you push under the rug. It's supposed to be something that you work for, and if you receive a reward, that you then turn around and say, okay, now I'm going to use that for not just myself, but but everyone around us. But he's right, too, that we do... Uh, the, I mean, it, I, I just, I'm so glad you brought this up, because none of this works if you are crippled by the fear of death. I mean, you can't have it mm-hmm. both ways. You can't just say, well... I'm terrified about dying. I'm going to spend every amount of money I get on any procedure that could possibly prolong my life and take away sickness. You cannot have that attitude and at the same time have any kind of um, anything but a get as much money as possible attitude when it comes to saving for retirement. You really have to choose between that fear um, and that trust in God. And I, it's easy for me to say now as a young man, if, I'm, if I am as uh, trusting in the Lord at uh, you're 82. at 82, uh, Ted, is that right? Wow. If I am as trusting the Lord, then I will, um, have learned a good lesson from you. So yeah. brings to mind the fact that, uh, my wife and I invested a, a significant amount of money to buy property that our uh, middle son hmm. has as a business. Wow. And Brilliant. For 30 years, uh, you know, he's had a business and raised the two granddaughters and, oh, wonderful. you know, by that real estate, you know, we own the real estate, you know, I gave him, you know, the business part of it. And it's actually, you know, lodge in, you know, in, in cabins that, um, uh, they're, they're pretty significant, uh, uh you know, what Brilliant. they are. And, and then he's got involved in addition to that as, uh, youth, uh, minister church for many years and is an evangelist and goes to things like the Super Bowl and all over the place, uh, y- you know, to uh, be able, you know, he's down at D.C. for the Cherry Blossom Festival, you know, yeah. witnessing to uh, people at that event. He's going to be up in uh, uh, Rochester uh, a couple weeks from now. And uh, so it's neat, you know, to see that kind of stuff happening. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's incredible. Well, Ted, thank you so much. It really has been a, a rich opportunity to, to speak with you, and I enjoyed it very much. God bless. All right, Ted. God bless you.